Hello my friends, this is the supplement for Ephesians 1, verse 1. I know what you're thinking, we're still in 1, verse 1, but it's just such an incredibly powerful um, passage of Scripture that we really have a lot to unpack. I trust that the first message um, really blessed you. It is a passage that definitely really blessed me, this incredible invitation to put off our false identity, this cape that Dante says that weighs us down, and Jesus said that this false self, but we, we have to die, deny that in order to actually walk in new life and be born again. So right now we're going to talk about exactly um, how to walk that out. How do we do that exactly? Paul had a strategy that he used, and he had some other friends that used the same strategy, and we're going to discuss that right now. Why don't we just spend a moment, and wherever you're at, um, just pray and ask the Spirit to fill you and to just give you that, that spiritual eyes and ears. Let's just do that. Yeah, Jesus, we pray for your Spirit to come and inform us, God. And your Spirit is so good. You say in the book of James that if we ask for wisdom, that your Spirit will will give it to us. So God, we ask for your wisdom, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Well, Paul says that we are in Christ, that we are seated in heavenly places. That is such a beautiful invitation. He says that oh, Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And, and that is where we are. The right hand is the hand um, that, that does the work. Like being a right hand man. And in the Psalms, it says that we are the right-hand men of God and women. That we actually get to bring His glory and His peace to earth. It's so beautiful. Paul says to the Colossians, For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. Christ is your life. And that word we talked about in the message, zoe, meaning fullness of life. Psalm 23 really explains that really well. Such a beautiful psalm of what zoe looks like. When I walk through difficult times, you are with me. He makes us lie down in green pastures. Besides still waters, he restores our soul. He leads us into righteousness. Here's something that's really resonated with me lately. It says that he prepares a meal for us in the presence of our enemies. In other words, we can just rest, enjoy communion with him. He will provide for us. Such a wonderful thing. And so, Paul, in order to receive this Zoe life and to be hidden, he had to deny his false self. And he went to great lengths to do this. He had a hard time doing it. You see, Paul obviously wasn't his name, but we have this misunderstanding that Paul um, had a name change upon his salvation. That's not what happened. Paul suddenly wasn't Paul the moment that he was saved. Let me explain. You see, Paul is Jewish, but he's also a Roman citizen, which is extremely rare. He would have been very much esteemed. We see this a lot when he's arrested and then they realize that he's a Roman and they are so um, apologetic for this. And he was taught by this man named Gamaliel. Now, this was a man who was the number one teacher in the Jewish world on earth. So Paul essentially had an education that would be similar to Yale or Harvard when people heard that he was discipled by this man, they were stunned. You see, Paul was also from the tribe of Benjamin, which meant that he had no skeletons in the closet. He came from this really pure lineage. And so Paul was the man. I don't know if you've seen The Chosen. You should watch it. It is incredible. But Nicodemus in The Chosen is this man they call the teacher of teachers. Everywhere he goes, people want to hear him just teach, to just pray for them. He is so respected and revered. Paul would have been that and even more. Paul was incredibly wealthy. 
Paul was incredibly powerful. But this is why he decided to change his name. You see, Saul was a name that meant large, powerful. Just like King Saul in the Old Testament. King Saul was this massive, powerful man. He towered over people, and Saul, that's what it meant to the Jewish people. Paul is a name that means small. It's a name that means almost weak. And so what he was saying was, I want to be humble now. I don't want to be Saul, I want to be small. And he intentionally humbled himself. This is the name that he chose for himself. Listen to what he says in the Philippians. He says, if somebody else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, a Pharisee as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever gains were to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. He is saying, I was the man, powerful. I had everything. But I now consider all that garbage. And he actually intentionally lays it all down. He intentionally lowers himself. You see, when we humble ourselves, it's not belittling who we are. It's not actually an active case of thinking bad about ourselves because we're saints. What it is is that it's considering others better and building them. This is what it is. This happened to him in his life and it became the model for the rest of his life. You see, there was this man named Joseph and he was a Levite, which meant that he worked in the temple. And Levites were poor. They got a tiny fraction of the tithe if there was enough. And because of that, um, when we read Deuteronomy 12 and 14, it talks about the poor in the, in, the, in the nation. It says there's the fatherless, the widow, the orphan. It says make sure you look after them. And it says the Levite. But this guy named Joseph happened to own land, likely passed down. So it allowed him to vote. It also gave him a voice and an income. Here's what Joseph did. He sold his field and gave it to the poor. He intentionally lowered his place in society and he built everyone else up. They changed his name to Barnabas, which I'm sure you've heard, which means encourager. Here's what he did. He just built everybody up. He lived to elevate. He intentionally lowered himself and intentionally elevated everybody else. And this now becomes his entire identity. The name Joseph is no longer used. It's Barnabas from here on out. 25 times in all in scripture. And here's what happened with Paul and Barnabas. Is he is saved dramatically on the road to Damascus. He was going to Damascus in a huff. Scripture says that he was snorting out anger like a, a horse or a wild animal. And he was going to Damascus to kill Christians. That's when Jesus gets a hold of him and the light shines. He goes blind. He ends up in a home. And in a vision, God tells Barnabas to go to Paul. But you see, this is scary. Because everyone's afraid of him. And nobody would want to go. But Barnabas shows up. And he finds Saul at that time. And he says, brother. It's the first word that he uses to greet him. He doesn't know that Saul is a changed man yet. The first word that he says to him builds him up. He immediately identifies him as part of his family, as a believer. Brother, he says. And he goes on to heal his eyes. See, Barnabas lived to elevate. 
It's what he did his entire life. And I want to be like a Barnabas. We went to Africa um, about 10 years ago, and we went with this wonderful pastor um, named Laurel Buckingham, and, and he told me something I will never forget. He told me that he was starting to meet with a lot of people, the premier of New Brunswick, other people in really high um, places and authority, and he said that he was so intimidated that he had to show that he also had credentials and that he was the man and that he had authority and he would be so nervous to try to prove himself to these people. And he said it dawned on him that instead of trying to elevate himself, every meeting he goes into now, he has one purpose. And that is to elevate that person. To make much of them. To speak life and identity into them. It changes how we actually go into every single encounter of our lives. It changes our marriage, how we parent. It changes how we date. It changes how we have employees or employers. It changes how we live in our little nuclear families. You see, if we're trying to build other people up and to make much of them, all of a sudden we become a Barnabas and all the pressure's off of us. This is so wonderful. So we get to celebrate others. We get to show like genuine interest and listen. When they talk, we can just not be on our phones. We can ask questions. We can encourage. This is the native tongue of a Christian. This is what we do. God will bring these things to mind when we elevate other people. Listen to how Jesus puts this. He says, when somebody invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you'll have to take the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So it's incredible. You see, at wedding feasts, the way that it worked at a Jewish wedding feast was that the place of honor was at the head of the table, and it was a hierarchy of importance. And so you wanted to be as close as you could to the head. They also had another table, which was like the children's table, per se, where there was all the new converts and lowlifes they considered. Jesus is saying, humble yourself, and I will exalt you. This is what we need to do. This was the culture that they lived in, that people were elevated, but Jesus did the opposite. What he did was he elevated the lowly. Matthew, who was a reviled tax collector, elevated. Mary Magdalene, demon-possessed, prostitute, elevated. Zacchaeus, elevated. This is what Jesus did. Everywhere he went, he elevated the lowly. And he actually opposed the proud. He actually humbled the exalted. This is what he did with the Pharisees. He consistently humbled them. This is what happened over and over and over. This is what he says about the Pharisees. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. Oh, you're thinking, what is going on? Phylacteries were these little boxes that they would keep the Torah in on the, their foreheads. This was something that they got from the book of Deuteronomy. It says, these commandments I give to you today that are to be on your hearts, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. So the Pharisees put them on their foreheads to show that, yeah, we're, we're following this idea in Deuteronomy. But they made them as big as possible to show off. Look at how extra holy we are. Look at the size of the Bible on their forehead. And the tassels on their garments 
These things were a reminder during prayer to focus on God. The way that they were tied um, actually shows the numbers that correspond to the letters that spell Yahweh. And what they did is they made their tassels so long so these Pharisees would have this giant um, phylactery on their forehead and they would have tassels up the back of their robes that would look like a wedding train and they would walk around all holy. And Jesus comes along and he humbles them. He said, they do not represent me. Jesus says, do the opposite of this. He says, pray in private. He says, if you give, give in secret. He says, if you fast, don't make a deal of it. Don't go telling everybody. Because when we humble ourselves, he exalts us. He says, if you give for people to see, then you've already received your reward. Peter says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And we do this by elevating others. We do this, like Paul says, to not look to our own interests. He says something remarkable. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. He also says, say nothing, no, no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. And he defines it as this, anything that doesn't build anyone else up, if it tears down, it's unwholesome. Be the opposite. Be like Barnabas. Be like Laura Buckingham. When we try to have our words and our life um, on display as powerful or mighty, the opposite takes place in our lives. Listen to what St. Francis of Assisi has to say. He said, O Divine Master, grant me that I may not seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand. That's amazing. I don't need to be understood. I need to understand. I need to listen. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Oh, this is a good word. Let me pray. Jesus, God, I thank you for your word, God. I thank you that, that we see this wonderful hiddenness in Paul. God, that he humbled himself. He became Paul. He considered all of his grandeur and position as garbage compared to knowing you. Jesus, help us to be that. Thank you for your word, Father. Amen.